to today's webinar. It's my privilege to host this as chair of Faiths United and as well as the chair of the Business Action Council. There is a reason that they are both relevant to today's discussion. Faiths United is a coalition of faith leaders and activists. We have all nine of the principal faiths in the UK and they came together at the beginning of the pandemic in response to COVID-19 uh, and in fact have a similar but younger Faiths United youth no network and they, they has, how do they put it, they, the voice for young people aged 18 to 30 from different faiths and none. So similar sort of things, they're looking at sharing of best practice, opportunities for collaboration in multiple areas. And not unlike the Business Action Council, which is again a coalition, this time of the UK's leading business representative organizations, who have come together collaborating to provide the consensus from business that the Prime Minister called for in response to the pandemic and have been doing some wonderful work together. Um, so these are all organizations who do a tremendous amount of work on their own, but have come together at this important time of national crisis to, um, to facilitate even greater impact. And since, we, since uh, Face United started, we've facilitated dialogue between communities, webinars such as these on pertinent issues, uh, supported grassroots and social action projects and undertaken a, a lot of consultation with government and showed a huge amount of support for frontline workers. And in fact, in today's webinar, we're going to be focus, focusing on the economic crisis that we're grappling with, which we, we know will have, unfortunately, long-term implications, particularly on young people's career prospects and well-being. Um, one of the people who's <clears throat> on our Business Action Council, economist from the Bank of England, the Bank of England has given a, a warning that the British economy will shrink by 14% this year. This is the worst shrinkage in 300 years. Youth unemployment in the UK could rise by 640,000 this year. That's a 50% increase, so we're just over 400,000 now, for those from eight, 18 to 24 who are unemployed. These are remarkable statistics, and, and they have a global impact too. 60 million people, according to the World Bank, would be pushed into what they describe as extreme poverty by the effects of coronavirus. So why is faith relevant to this? Um, what, th th these are business economic issues. But faith is relevant to business for, for many of us because it provides a moral framework, a thought leadership on the challenges around income, around equality, but also by providing support, networks, infrastructure. Um, and I'll give you just a couple of, uh, of our faith leaders who've, who've uh, given some interesting perspectives, Justin Welby. The uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, who said, uh, we are failing those who will grow up into a world where the gap between the richest and poorest parts of the country is significant and destabilizing. And from another part of the world, the Dalai Lama said, the world has also learned that economic growth by itself cannot close the gap between rich and poor. So in today's webinar, we're going to explore the role of faith in the business arena discussing what the faith communities can do to support jobs and help stimulate an economic recovery. So I'm delighted that we're joined by four very esteemed individuals who have led very successful business careers, influenced by their respective faiths and their bios for brevity will be posted on the chat. So I'm gonna hand over to each speaker, then we'll do a Q&A session before wrapping up at 150. So for good housekeeping purposes, please note this is on record and do post your questions on the chat. And with that, I will turn face first. Uh, the 13, uh, we're going to do Dame Helena Morrissey. Uh, Dame, Helena has been the uh, one of her many, many things. She was founder of the 30% Club, which has been campaigning for greater female representation on company boards. 
And uh, she herself has done a huge amount. I think she, she makes up a good percentage of that by all of her various positions that she's taken. That's one way to uh, deliver your, <laughs> hit your targets by, by, by signing up wherever possible, which you have done, and including uh, as a, a non-executive director, St. James Place. So firstly, over to you, and then I will introduce Karen. Well, thank you so much, Maurice, and it's a great pleasure to uh, join your discussion this afternoon. Um, so let me just um, start. I, I need to emphasize uh, quite unashamedly that the Christian faith, which is um, my faith, starts with the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Um, it's an obvious point, but it needs to be the lodestone for any and all engagement by Christians with uh, the issues of the day, whether we're talking about the economy or other problems such as groups of people being excluded or, or suffering in other ways. So it, it might come out a bit wrong by saying this, but I want to emphasize that the purpose of the church is not primarily to make our world a better or wealthier place. Instead, it's to proclaim to people everywhere that the gift of salvation is available here and now, and that then everything good flows from this. So the starting point for Christians has to be God and his kingdom. Now, having said that, sadly, many Christians, even those uh, sometimes in leadership positions, uh, seem to feel these days rather embarrassed to reference their faith, certainly in public discourse. And instead, what they often talk about, they, they align themselves with the mores of contemporary culture, presumably to try and seem more relevant. Um, I'm going to put quote marks around the relevant in um, what is unfortunately, and for many people, a secular society. And so these Christians who have great influence or could tend to often downplay the spiritual. They seem afraid of what will happen if they speak what they believe. And I believe very strongly that that approach undermines the purpose of church on earth and it prevents us Christians from making the contribution we can make to the issues such as the problems around the economy that Morris has already alluded to. Now, in the Bible, there are many, um, there are many useful guides uh, to how we can um, make sure that we are using our faith um, and not being afraid. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, it says, the fear of man, other people, bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall feel safe. So put another way, if you're afraid of other people, you fall into a trap, you tend to compromise, you feel under pressure to change. But when God is your foundation, your ultimate authority, then you understand as written in the Psalms, Psalm 118, um, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. Uh, solutions, in other words, are found through God, through our beliefs, not by hiding from them or hiding them from the world. Now, I have to say, and already we've, we've heard some of the, the, the bad statistics out there, our world system um, and our current situation gravitates towards the negative. But the Bible again teaches that we shouldn't act or think necessarily as the world does. Um, in fact, we are encouraged in um, the book of John, chapter seven, um, that we are to, to not be of this world, to take us ourselves away from the world, to be protected from evil, um, and to be focused on God's standards, uh, standards of honesty and excellence. But of course, let's go back to the situation that we're in today. We know we live in very difficult times. People feel excluded spiritually, emotionally, financially. And there are, as has already been said, widening inequalities, and they're only getting worse after the coronavirus crisis. Now, the financial services industry is often held as at least partially responsible for this. Um, now, I have worked in the city in financial services for over 30 years. And I have to say, it is a very innovative, very exciting environment in so many ways, and it's full of very talented people. But it is also prone to corruption. Um, and there are some few dominant leaders who set the cultural tone. And there are many teachings, again, in the Bible about the risk of wealth and the pursuit of wealth leading to greed. But there's also no harm, and in fact, we're encouraged to earn money through honest work, and then, of course, we have the opportunity to both provide for ourselves, our families, and to help others who are less fortunate than us. But it is very unusual indeed to hear anybody in the city, in the financial services industry, talking openly about their religion. And I'd say, actually, especially to hear them talking about being Christian. 
And what people do tend to talk about is integrity, about the need to conduct our business ethically. But the fundamental problem is this is very difficult to do and to stick to if you don't really believe in very much. And if you perhaps don't even have a strong sense of underlying values, what's right and wrong. It's very hard to know how to behave ethically in every situation if you don't have a moral compass. Now, I talked about my religious beliefs recently uh, when I was um, a castaway, as it's called, on Desert Island Discs um, on the radio. And I was contacted by a lot of people afterwards, including people who work in business, including people who work in the city. And they were surprised that they were welcoming of uh, what I had said, um, but they were also remarked on how remarkable it was to hear God and Jesus and Christianity in particular mentioned. And I've been thinking very hard ever since before, or is kindly requested, um, asked me to join today's panel. You know, how can we bring these two worlds together? How can Christianity help us to, to heal the divides, to reduce inequalities, and to help with economic growth, and to help as we try to recover from the very many impacts of the coronavirus crisis, especially around young people's prospects? Now, if there is going to be a meaningful contribution from Christians to the next phase for this country, Christians are very much going to have to be engaged and to be engaged on the inside of businesses and industries that are creating or losing jobs. If Christians remain outside the tent, as it's sometimes called, as one of many voices clamoring for attention or just not having the authority, then our power to change anything is very restricted. Now, I believe um, that the church has a very big opportunity now to step up, to not hide its religiousness from secular society but instead to step up and train and mentor people of faith into how they can use their faith in business and provide leadership with integrity and honesty. Now I've seen the power of mentoring, the 30% club, which is included in my bio, um, which as Morris said, is set up to a campaign for women on boards. One of the things we do is to run a, a big mentoring scheme. It's about to start its ninth year, um, around 7,000 people have been mentored or mentored others through this scheme. Um, and, and the program so far has involved more than a hundred different organizations. And we've, so we've been creating change, not so much from the top down, telling people what to do, but actually from the bottom up, from inside out, from changing people's um, confidence in themselves in that case. But also I see that there's a power to change um, the way people operate, to, to reach out to them in other ways as well. Uh, just to give you an example, um, through this mentoring scheme, the 30% Club scheme, uh, men make up more than half the mentors actually. And many of them have told me how much of an impact it's made on them hearing the experiences that women have in business that they might not tell their manager um, because they might be too embarrassed or shy to. And I believe that those men learn at least as much from their experience of mentoring as the mentees do. And I, I think the church could do something quite similar and on a much bigger scale and also could mentor those who are really looking for work, who don't know where to start. The bottom line, before I move on to the next, before you move on to the next panelist, is I think we need to have Christians who are active in places of influence and, and who then um, use their power beyond the church. Christians who are willing to speak up um, and who are encouraged to do so um, about why the saving grace of Christ can transform business, business ethics and the world for good. But not by just adopting, you know, this idea that anything goes, by being tolerant of everybody, by actually, by being Christian, by going to the seats of power in our troubled world and telling them about God and how we can transform lives to make the case for Jesus, to help to heal and to offer a lasting and true way forward. In conclusion, you might think this sounds very over ambitious, that we need to start with something more practical. Um, it's not one thing or the other. I've suggested a practical step like mentoring, but that needs to be set in the context of real values, real beliefs, real opportunity to live our lives joyfully. And I've learned through my experiences um, that whatever our circumstances, each of us can do something. I've taken uh, inspiration from the words of an American author, historian and Unitarian minister, Edward Everett Hale, who said, I'm only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And I will not let what I cannot do interfere with what I can do. So even if the church, the Christian church in this country as a whole, isn't ready for a big program along the lines I'm suggesting, 
individual ministries and individual people can do something. We can, we can reach out to offer our assistance to those that need it, to share our knowledge and experience, to teach the businesses in which we operate how to move forward in a better way, and to help those who are looking for meaningful, fulfilling opportunity in work, to get work, to be clear how and where to seek it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helena. I've just turned on uh, my uh, a, a different background because you've inspired me. You're quite right. We don't often speak and from a perspective of our faiths and um, not necessarily out of embarrassment, but just rather it's not the secular environment that we live in. And we, we sometimes forget that. And it's a very important call to action for all of us to be mindful of that uh, because we can have such an impact on society. And indeed, uh, Karen, who I'm going to introduce now, Lord Karen Lamoria, President of the Confederation of British Industries, the CBI, um, is not only Chairman of the uh, Cobra Via Partnership, but he is the first Zoroastrian Parsi to sit in the House of Lords and never makes any bones. His, his Zoroastrian faith is, is a big part and he's very openly talks about it in his uh, conversation. So uh, he definitely uh, will subscribe to your su suggestions as I'm now doing by changing my background. So over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Maurice. And thank you for organizing this great event. And it's great to follow my university contemporary, Helena Morrissey, and her husband. We were all at university together at the same time. And um, I, I love what, what you've just said. Uh, I, as Maurice say, come from, a, I'm a Zoroastrian Parsi. And um, when I took over as the UK chairman of the Indo-British Partnership in 2003, which is now the UK-India Business Council, my counterpart, the Indian co-chair, was Narayan Murthy of Infosys, uh, Rishi Sunak, our chancellor's father-in-law. And uh, I remember when I met him, he said, I've never met a bad Parsi. And the Zoroastrian Parsis, we're one of the smallest communities in the world. There are less than 100,000 of us uh, in the world today. In India, less than 60,000 in the UK, barely 6,000. And Mahatma Gandhi said that in numbers, Parsis are beneath uh, contempt, but in contribution beyond compare. And, and the faith was brought by the prophet Zoroaster around 1,500 BC. It's said to be the world's oldest monotheistic religion. Um, and and, and the, with the concept of a, 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 a God, a supreme a being, a, the concept of good and evil and heaven and hell, um, and this was the religion of the largest of the ancient empires, the Persian Empire. It was the religion of uh, Xerxes, Darius, and Cyrus the Great. Uh, and, and the basis of the Zoroastrian faith is three words, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Humata, hukta, hurvashta. And um, I was uh, the founding chair of the World Zoroastrian Chamber of Commerce in the UK. And our motto is uh, industry and integrity. And Helena mentioned the word integrity, and I will, I will come to that shortly. Uh, I gave a lecture at the uh, Zoroastrian, World Zoroastrian Congress in Bombay, in Mumbai, a few years ago, and the title of my lecture was The Everlasting Flame of Zoroastrian Identity, an Unbroken Thread of Achievement from Cyrus the Great to Today. And Cyrus the Great, of course, is famous for the Cyrus Cylinder, which sits in the British Museum, which was um, 530 BC. And it notes um, the importance of Cyrus's humility and tolerance, which form vital aspects of the entire tradition of the Zoroastrian faith. We talk about the Magna Carta being the Bill of Human Rights. Well, the Magna Carta is only 800 years old. Uh, Cyrus, Cyrus the Cylinder is 530 BC. Um, and Cyrus was very well known for his magnanimity. Um, a specific example of that being with the refuge that he gave to the Jews in Egypt. The Old Testament and the Torah both note this as shown in the passage from the book of Ezra. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and yet charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So it's important to note that neither Cyrus nor his major high priests in his court who acted as advisors sought to convert the people of the conquered lands of the Zoroastrian faith. As a figure, Cyrus was determined to ensure that the territories he conquered, often lands that had been under the domination of other empires, had their traditional forms of worship and religious practices restored to the people who lived there. And I'm so grateful for this country that allows anyone of any religion to worship. And today we have an aspirational country where anyone can get to the top, regardless of race, religion, 
or background. And to me, the Zoroastrian community has lived this over the centuries about good values leading to the everlasting flame of the community. And, and many misuse the word, but I think the Zoroastrian community uh, do embody the term integrity. And I think we've, we've gained in integrity through our proper action and via a strong sense of heritage, identity, and an instinctive, unarrogant humility and confidence without hubris over the generations. And I remember welcoming the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, when he was Archbishop of Canterbury to the Zoroastrian House in Harrow uh, some years ago. And as the patron of the community, I made the opening speech. He then responded and made his lecture. And then when he delivered his lecture, he said, the Lord Billamore has used the word integrity twice in his speech. And he said the word integrity, he said the Zoroastrian community are renowned for their integrity. And the word integrity comes from the Latin and Greek words integra, integrum, that mean wholeness. You cannot practice integrity if you're fragmented in front of the light. You could only practice integrity if you're whole and complete. And, and in, in, in this aspect, uh, I think that the in industry and integrity that I spoke about, uh, the righteousness is, is at the heart of what we do. And the Tatas, I mean, everyone uh, knows the Tatas. Well, that's founded by Jamshedi Tata. Jamshedi Tata, they're a Parsi company. He was an ordained Zoroastrian priest. And the, he lived the good words, good thoughts, uh, good deeds. And it was relevant to the values of the business that he created. He practiced that integrity. And then trust, the word trust, maybe in the q and I will expand more about that. And I held, uh, an, uh, the Zoroastrian All-Party Parliamentary Group held an event about religion's impact on business. And we had a panel, and one of the panelists was my predecessor as Chancellor of the University of Birmingham, Sir Dominic Cadbury. And he spoke about the Quakers and about Quaker capitalism. And of course, Cadbury's is a household name, a global name. And he spoke about how the Quakers, their industrious, independent-minded entrepreneurship, the Barclays, the Lloyds, Lloyds was funded by Quakers, Friends Provident, Cadbury's, and it's all about straight dealing, fair play, honesty, accuracy, the truth. Bourneville, the community which I drive through on the way to the university from London, created by the Cadbury's so that their workforce could have the most amazing environment, their own place to live. And Jamshedi Tata did the same thing with Jamshedpur, which is a township, which is a model around the world. And of course, Dominic Cadbury's brother, Sir Adrian Cadbury, was behind the famous Cadbury Code on corporate governance, which is all about values uh, as well. And you know, the benevolence goes down the generations, and I am proud to be a Tata scholar when I came to study here in the UK. And, and, and just as I conclude, the Tata's belief that business is sustainable only when it serves the larger purpose in society and the long-term objectives that businesses strive towards is typified as a statement. And I quote Jamshedji Tata, in a free enterprise, the community is not just another stakeholder to business, but is in fact the very purpose of its existence. This view was crucial in, in improving the working conditions in the country and helped give Indian workers their self-respect back. And in my own small way with my, my Cobra Beer Company, we believe our motto is to aspire and achieve against all odds with integrity. We believe that it's not just good enough to be the best in the world, you have to be the best for the world. And it's not just what you do, but how you do it. And finally, I conclude with this. This is also to do with identity. And I think the minority ethnic and religious communities in this country, and I led a debate on this in the House of Lords, it is one of the reasons for the contribution of the less than 15% of the population that we are still one of the six largest economies in the world. And it is this country that has given us that opportunity. And as Professor Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate said, we have multiple identities. And in my case, I'm proud to be a Zoroastrian Parsi. I'm proud to be an Indian. And I'm proud to be a nation in Britain. And I'm proud to be British. Thank you for those inspiring words, Karen. And we'll come back to some of that in the questions, as you mentioned, and go straight to John Booth. And as you will see in your chat, you have more um, expanded bios because all of the panelists, uh, we could take up a good chunk of this webinar just going through their uh, positions and achievements. But he's a businessman, a philanthropist. He chairs the Prince's Trust Council alongside numerous public and private companies, including uh, Maintel, 
PLC and, and the London Theatre Company too. So John, straight over to you. Thank you, Maurice. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, I, I was going to just give you a very brief um, insight into my own formation, uh, like Helena, as a, as a Christian, uh, and what, what that's meant to me during my business career before talking a little bit more about the Prince's Trust um, and how we work um, with people of all faiths and none and uh, the importance of that to the uh, ethos of the Trust. I was lucky enough to be brought up by um, two Christian par parents uh, and uh, emphatically my mother who had a very strong um, Christian faith. She was a Baptist um, and both of them were school teachers. So it, it was actually quite an important part of their, um, their self-identity that they became school teachers because they believed this was somewhere where they could exercise their faith and do good. And I think I've been lucky to inherit from them both a, a, a sort of practical sense uh, of being a Christian and what that means in my life and in the workplace. And like Helena, I, I lament um, the fact that over the last 30 years, really, um, we, we've been less able and less comfortable speaking out about our faith. And I, I rather hope um, that we might be reaching a, a sort of Kairos moment um, in this great disaster which is in, uh, unfolding before us, uh, where the voice of faith um, can speak more clearly and uh, unashamedly than it has in recent times. Um, I think this forum um, and all our many interfaith um, dialogues um, have borne the fruit that we can now um, speak as people of faith in, in a way that is more powerful than the speaking out individually. And indeed, I think uh, when uh, this country was becoming more multicultural in, in the last 50 years, um, it, it's been an, in, an inhibitor to individual faiths speaking out because out of courtesy, they wanted to give each other's faith uh, some space. But I think now that we all feel more confident acting together, this will be a, a great moment. But um, going back to how I then came from a Christian home uh, into business, I, I was lucky to go to a university where um, Christianity was, was still very high profile. Uh, and I attended a college where the chapel was, was one of the sort of two or three centres of, of, of college life, um, together with the dining hall and the sports field, I suspect. Um, and so I, I've always been comfortable talking about my faith to friends throughout my education. And I have to say that coming to work in London in the first instance in advertising, uh, which didn't work out very well, I spent two unhappy years uh, as an advertising executive, um, and, and then starting off in, in finance after that, um, it was quite a shock that uh, this wasn't really a sort of regular feature of the dialogue with, with friends. And of course, you know, at that stage didn't go to church anymore. Um, and as an Anglican, it's been rather depressing to see this um, decline in, in worshipping numbers, um, which has, has really left us, um, you know, quite a, a, a small denomination. Um, and also for the Anglican Church, and I, I say this as a 15-year veteran of our General Synod, uh, to be divided by various internal controversies, um, which have been a huge distraction from the work of conversion um, and the work of uh, practical Christianity uh, in terms of social engagement and all, all those things that the church at its most powerful uh, and best times in its history uh, has been so good at. And if you look back at, at the Victorian church in London, um, its real cutting edge was social action, work among the poor, work among people with chronic illnesses and so on. Uh, and we've slightly lost our mojo in that respect. And again, now this enormous a great community. So my attitude um, being a Christian in the workplace has generally been driven by trying as best as I can to embody the Christian 
virtues that others have already spoken of, such as integrity um, in all that I do. And we have a lovely saying in the Christian church, which is that you should try and see Jesus in everyone. And I think looking at, at your uh, fellow human beings and looking for Jesus in them uh, is always a good place to start. So that your working relationships are characterized by respect. And, and of course, you know, the great commandment we have as Christians, love the Lord thy God and love the, your neighbor as yourself. So loving the people we work with, however hard that sometimes is, you know, that's, that's been a kind of touchstone for me. I haven't always succeeded, but I've always tried. Um, and then recognizing also that, uh, again, a, a, a sort of Christian prayer, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own do we give you, so that every success you have um, comes from God and you need to be open-handed in sharing it. Um, so I, I think well, you know, one or two practical outworkings of that have been, um, for example, in, in some work I did um, on ethical investing where the Church of England has been something of a pioneer uh, and where we now have a very powerful movement of ESG, environmental, social and good corporate governance investing, driven forward uh, by, by people like Helena. And I think people of all faiths can be very proud of the DNA from our faiths that is running through ESG investing. And the younger generation really get this, you know, the environment is is right up there as uh, you know top three concerns. Uh, social, acceptable, responsible social behaviour, you know, really important. Um, again, you know, we fall short, but as an aspiration, it's vital. And then good corporate governance, meaning that you invest in companies that take take those qualities seriously. I, I think is something we now need to reunite with a faith manifesto and say. Uh, that without our faiths, there'd be no point in you know, doing all this stuff. All, all this derives from a view of our place in the creative order of things. Moving on to the Prince's Trust, of course, our, our great inspiration is our founder and president, uh, and uh, a man who is perfectly comfortable at all times speaking out, not only about his faith, um, but about all faiths and the importance of faiths, and his role uh, which he believes is God-given to defend faiths um, and that has always from day one 43 44 years ago at the trust been a vital part of the work and I've occasionally had to push him on introducing uh, more digital content to what we do really important at the moment of course and he's always said actually it's the people that make a difference it's our thousand or so staff and are 4,000 volunteers and mentors and others have spoken about mentoring and I, I kind of take it as read that at the moment you think of volunteering to mentor at a charity you're you're doing that out of altruism you're doing it because you're thinking about other people and it doesn't at that moment matter whether you're doing it because of your faith or, or none but it does matter that it's out of concern for people and I think mentoring at the Prince's Trust uh, has been one of the most important aspects of our whole mission really because together with the way in which our staff respectfully treat our, our young clients it helps them find their self-confidence it helps them believe in themselves it helps them locate themselves in in this God-given universe and so as, as we look at um, helping young people to um, cope with and thrive in this terrible time. Um, I think that there are a few ideas which are beginning to form practically at the Prince's Trust of what we might do differently. And we're working, uh, as we always do with government at the moment, on, on how we will address the terrible scourge of youth unemployment. Um, it will be particularly tough because many of the young people that we help find their first jobs in industries like hospitality and retail, which have a disproportionate amount of, of younger staff. And of course, those are the very industries that have been hardest hit. So we're talking to government about releasing funding for digital skills training. And I, I was thrilled to hear in the Chancellor's statement last week 
two or three schemes that I think faith communities can really pick up and run with. So the Kicks got this kickstart scheme, uh, which will see the government pay the wages of new young employees for six months, a uh, two billion fund um, where thousands of work placements for young people 60, 16 to 24 um, will have their entire national minimum wage covered for a 25 hour work week. And I think that the faith communities will be able to pick up that ball because of course we've got the most fantastic networks and network those young people from our communities into the employers that our communities also hold. There'll also be a new payment available to employers who take on new apprentices. And for each apprentice hired between the 1st of August and the 31st of January next year, the employer will receive £2,000 uh, for, I think, the under 25s, 1500 for the over 25s. And again, this is a scheme that, uh, as people of faith with our networks, we can you know, leap on with joy and say, uh, we can help find those young people, we can help find those employers. Uh, I think the most important practical advice I, I can offer today is that I know my church networks work really well um, in times of, of trouble. Uh, you know, we've been great at food banks, um, we've been great, great at um, helping people who've got into problems with, with credit and debt. Um, and I think we will need to regard unemployment as the national number one problem starting, you know, 1st of September when people get back from their notional holidays for the foreseeable future, at least for the next 18 months until the economy has got, got some um, steam back into it. Thank you very much, John. I'm sure that will be come up in the Q&A as well. And if I may, uh, I think we, we are looking, and you'll see from the chats, a lot of focus on some of the things you just started to talk about, the real practical things that the faith communities can be doing. Um, and I hope, uh, Nausha, uh, you, if you can kick it off with, with some thoughts around that as well to, to get the um, focus on what we, we are all doing. You're coming from, the, from a, a Muslim tradition, Ismail. Uh, Naushad Jibraj is the CEO of, of uh, the Queensway Group, but also he's president of the Ismaili Council for the UK, uh, and, and alongside that chairman of Focus Humanitarian Assistance Europe Foundation, which is one of the Aga, Khan, uh, Aga Khan's development networks, its affiliates. So please give, give us some thoughts, and particularly if you can, about how the faith community specifically can be uh, alongside what the uh, Chancellor and others are doing and providing, and certainly what John was suggesting, a very big one uh, for youth that, that was just mentioned. What are your, your thoughts and from your community? Now, Shad, over to you. Thank you, Maurice. I mean, I, I'm going to give you my personal um, uh, sort of uh, story in terms of, um, you know, my, my experience. But first of all, good afternoon, uh, and thank you for inviting me to this really interesting conversation because now more than ever, there is uh, less separation between our personal and professional lives. So as you've said, I belong to the Shia Ismaili Muslim community, whose spiritual leader is His Highness Prince Karim Aga Khan, uh, as the 49th hereditary Imam, spiritual leader, and direct descendant of uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, may peace be upon him. Ismailism encourages us um, to balance our material and spiritual life like two sides of a coin. So you cannot have one without the other. And the social vision of Islam so reminds us that we are all created from one single soul. And it encourages us to sort of understand and appreciate the ethnic and cultural diversity. It also urges us to be kind, compassionate, not to forget importance of uh, honesty and, uh, as uh, Lord Billamoria said, integrity, and to remember that our actions and reputation can serve as a role model to others around us. Uh, we also believe actually it's our responsibility to support those less fortunate than ourselves by being generous with our resources, whether that be knowledge uh, time or financial. So I run a family business called Queensway, uh, which is rooted in real estate and hospitality. 
And people and relationships are at the heart of what we do. The values that drive the way in which I run my business, um, where we aim to instill a culture of openness, trust, and shared values of challenging everything, working together, being kind, and more, most importantly, having fun. It's these values, they come to life in every decision that we make whether it's a recruitment decision or an investment decision. And we believe that together we can better the world around us. And this starts with the way actually in which, how, in which we treat our own team members. So we have a workforce of around 600 employees that speak 34 languages. There's cultural diversity, which is at our core. It's a strength that fuels the creativity and the human connection in our organization. What transcends, uh, we believe, every culture is kindness. And we extend this to everyone that we interact with. So within Queensway, our employees design local and company-wide initiatives to raise money for charities. Uh, and in the last two years, we've raised close to 200,000 pounds for causes that we as a company believe in. We've set up our own foundation, it's the Queensway Foundation, which provides confidential support to our own team members, from payday loans, to relationship support, to addiction advice. The foundation aims to be the place where our team members can come to when they face any kind of life challenge. And you can imagine the people that we have working with us, young people, in the hospitality sector. Voluntary service is a huge part of being an Ismaili Muslim. Uh, and it has been in my blood since childhood. It started with me taking people's shoes in our local Jamaat Khana, our, our equivalent of a mosque. And over time, it sort of led me to organizing uh, large scale events, leading our community's economic planning board, and recently, as you said, chairing Focus Humanitarian Assistance Europe, a disaster relief charity. And I have to say that the skills that I have learned from this exposure has been absolutely key part of my growth as an individual, a team player, a leader. And I'm grateful every single day for belonging to my community. Members of the Ismaili community are situated uh, over, in over 25 countries around the world. Uh, and where Ismailis reside in large numbers, His Highness the Aga Khan has set up national council structures. And this team of around 20, 20 members are appointed by His Highness to serve voluntarily on a three-year term. And together, their work focuses on issues related to youth, economic, health, social, educational, legal, human resource, and the welfare of our community members in our jurisdiction. So I currently serve, I have the honor of serving as a president of the uh, Ismaili community here in the UK and in countries in Europe, which include Germany, Sweden, Denmark, and Austria amongst others. And our vision is to have a community with faith and ethics, which is united and stable, that can uplift humankind today and for generations to come. And we are focusing on the role we play as a faith community to ensure that our impact goes well beyond our immediate community to actually positively contributing to the societies in, in which we live. So today, taking time for reflection and personal contemplation is critical. And we have over 50 permanent spaces for members of our community to visit where they can experience quiet, peace, and privacy to escape the distraction of the world in which we are currently living. Our community institutions are a trusted source of support, especially for the vulnerable segments of our, of our community. Um, we know who they are, and we offer them long-term generational support and change. 
Our Aspire program, for example, offers long-term mentoring and coaching to our youth. We have family liaison officers who provide a holistic tailored support to our vulnerable that address issues like housing, education, health, and debt. And as a faith community, we have the potential to act like alumni networks. And we've created trade alliances in businesses to support the similar business sectors. So for example, community entrepreneurs in the hotel, dental, or care home sectors all come together and benefit from these alliances, which aim to share knowledge and network, as well as benefit from economies of scale. And we believe that you know, we have a responsibility to serve the communities in which we live, to impact the communities uh, positively in the neighborhood that we live in as well. And so, for example, the Aga Khan Foundation has a collaboration with the Prince's Trust, where we are working on employability opportunities for youth, as well as fundraising initiatives. We're also providing mentors for the Prince's Trust's uh, health and social care initiative for training of young people. And for your information, His Highness the Aga Khan is actually the global founding patron of the Prince's Trust uh, group. We also look at future skills and human skills that we need to survive and thrive in the future. Um, and we provide voluntary opportunities within faith communities. We believe uh, we give young people the chance to hone soft skills as a natural and fun way to engage. Now, now, actually, may, may I take that as a perfect segue? I don't want to lose because you've, you've, you've raised some, some fantastic points there that I think others need to come in on. You mentioned you know, the connectivity that you have as a community and how you're able to use that in mentoring, coaching, and linking with what John is doing um, in Princess Trust and the trade alliances and some of these soft skills, which in fact the, the Face Forum for London has been doing some of this. So it's, it's, I think what's really key here, what's interesting as we now segue into sort of Q&A from your, from your points, the platform that you've mentioned, all of those things, what's unique about the faith communities? So besides Rishi Sunak's offer to, to young people, what you were just referring to now, that mentoring, because your community, because you and those in your community know those individuals, so perhaps could mentor uh, or be trusted maybe to mentor and know the individuals who are vulnerable and need that support better than you know, Job Center Plus. Um, so so that, that's the unique bit. And I think that's the key that everyone, some, if you look at some of the comments in the chat questions, you know, are there websites where young people can find out about these things? Because what's really important is not just what you do individually as an Ismaili in your community or each of us in our faith communities, but what we can do across the board, which is what we've tried to do with Faith One London bringing together, and of course, Faith United, which uh, your, your, your colleague uh, has, uh, is, is one of, um, uh, one of yeah. our, our key members. So just some thoughts around that. And uh, as a Farhad, who's been wonderful, as you know, uh, on Faith United, how do we link up some of these things? And what do you as individuals, um, communities add that's different to what's happening in the secular world? So I think we, you know, as I said earlier, we have a national council structure that has many uh, 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 sort of functions. One of them, for example, specifically to do with the economy is the economic planning board uh, that, that we have within the council. And that uh, is a board of nine people with a whole load of committee members uh, who effectively handhold the young people. So we sort of read what's going on out there. We understand what Rishi is, uh, has provided, but then through knowing who requires support, we handhold them through the process to ensure that they're able to benefit from whatever's out there. We've also just recently launched Ismaili Civic. Ismaili Civic is our platform to engage with communities outside of our own to provide this kind of support and handholding 
uh, uh, which is what we're doing currently with the, with the Prince's Trust. And it would be great to find other examples of that connectivity. Yes, Helena. Your... Yeah, no, I just, um, well, I want to say two things. Uh, sadly, um, I will have to drop off the course shortly because I had a clash that we were, um, I think we just enjoy talking about what we're doing here, So, uh, which is a good thing, I think. Um, but I wanted to just chime in on this point because I think it does show, I mean, you've got the Business Action Council, Maurice, and it does show that there is perhaps a, a, re, a call for, a demand for a, a Faiths Action Council in the same sort of way, not to want to proliferate lots of things or else some sort of extension of the Faiths United where we could have a specific um, economic help and assistance. Um, all of us, I think, have mentioned mentoring um, uh, portal or um way that we could collect collate all the different suggestions being made here because i do think the power lies in the aggregation um obviously we're not trying to convert people necessarily as well people if we pulled it all together then people can choose what appeals to them um so that was one suggestion i did also just want to come back because i saw there was some um traffic on the chat about um good, you know, socially responsible investing, as uh, an allusion to John's comments about the Church of England's mandate and so forth. And I think this is another way that um, the investment community, certainly, which is where I'm really from, can make more of an impact on how we, as it were, build back better. I do know from experience, though, that it's really hard to impose um, any sort of ethical framework on um, across the board. Each person, each group, each uh, client has their own ethics. Uh, what we need to do is make sure that each organization like the Church of England is already doing uh, really is insistent when it um, has managers managing sometimes for a very large sums of money that it's using that money um, and reflecting its values, its ethics, its, its beliefs. And I think that does happen somewhat, somewhat, but hasn't happened perhaps enough. So I, I just wanted to make those two points and to apologize for um, having to drop off before we finish. No, fantastic. Thank you for that. And, and uh, John, Karen, do you have any thoughts as well, specifically, besides the call to action for a faith action council? Very interesting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another group. But, <laughs> yeah, no, no, because it's very important. We're, you know, we want to do business. We want to get business going, but we have a particular angle from the faith communities. How best to tap into that? Um, Karen, John, do you have any thoughts? Just, just from the connectivity in terms of communities, what we can do specifically to help the young people perhaps get the um, uh, training that they require, some of the soft skills that uh, Naushad was, was mentioning. And I, I'm not surprised because uh, Farhad Mawani from, uh, is within Faith Action, Faith, Faith United has been talking with us all about, you know, what are the things that we can do as faith communities to really help the young people who are going to be so challenged find you know better skills mentoring and and opportunities so any other thoughts how, how i know john you're doing a huge amount in you go on it talks I, I mean i i think one of the things that um, i i know they're always appreciative of is is briefing our faith leaders um on on matters uh concerning you know b business in the broadest sense but certainly you know, really um, salient, important issues like youth unemployment and what business is doing about them. And uh, I, I worked, uh, you know, somewhat closely with um, with Rowan Williams um, on one or two initiatives. And um, I know that um, the the uh, chief rabbi, you know, historically has been very well briefed on on business because the Jewish business community is quite coherent and, and active in that in that sense um, but but I sometimes uh, when I hear our, our bishops for example talking about business um, slightly despair that they don't really understand the the way uh, you know we approach our, our business lives as people of faith um, and I, th I think taking it you know to them so that they can uh, show some leadership on, on this is, is probably quite a useful thing that isn't being universally done at the moment, I, I guess. Karen, you want to say something? If, if I may just um, build on this, there, uh, there are two things I want to, uh, points I want to make. One is, um, Norshad spoke about trust. Uh, John mentioned respect and love. 
And, and um, a Harvard Business School professor uh, who, who taught me, Francis Fry, gave a lecture recently on the whole concept of trust. And that's what a lot of this is about, is, is trust. And, and she described it as a triangle. One, to have, to get trust, you have to be authentic. Uh, is it, it, secondly, to get trust, you have to have the logic. Are you competent, professional? Are you credible? And the thirdly, you've got to have empathy. Are you in it for them? So you've got to have all three aspects. And I think a lot of what we've been talking about is, is getting trust. And it's so crucial. You can't without those three aspects. And then linked to that with diversity. I mean, Helena's done that amazing work with the 30% Club, with women on boards, getting women in business. I'm working in my new role at the CBI. I'm the first ethnic minority president of CBI uh, to, to start an equivalent, a sort of 15% Club, to get ethnic minority, uh, black, Asian, and minority ethnic board members in the FTSE 100, FTSE 250 start with, as well as in business in general. And, and this whole diversity, this is where the Faith Forums of London, the work that you do, mm -hmm. I, from my being in the Indian Army with my father, I grew up celebrating all religions. So I don't think it's a matter of tolerance. We're in a position now in this country to actually celebrate all religions within any organization which we work. And I see it in my own business. We worship in a church, we will go and worship with our Muslim colleagues in a mosque. It's wherever it is. Um, it's celebrating each other's religions, celebrating together, celebrating that diversity. That's fantastic. You, a number of really important points. Helena, thank you very much for joining mm -hmm. us. I know you have to you. go. We're, we're just wrapping up now. I'm going to ask thank Zachy, you. Uh, Zaki Cooper to come and uh, join us and, and to do that. Thanks. But it is uh, of deep uh, importance to each faith community because they have, as you say, that knowledge about their communities and that trust for all the three points that you mentioned uh, Francis Fry had uh, enumerated. So thank you for, very much for that. And if I could hand over uh, to Zaki to, to do that, uh, the thanks. Zaki Kupo has been an inspiration behind Faith United. Over to you. Maurice, thank you very much. And thank you too, to uh, Dame Helena, to Lord Karan, to John and to Naushad. Um, for those of us who've been on this lunchtime call, I think we've all had a lunchtime treat. Um, we've heard from the speakers what faith means to them and how it affects their practice as top business people, as well as they th what they think about the contribution that faith communities can make in the crisis. Um, at Faith United, we see a link between faith and business. Uh, faith is not just for our churches, our mosques, our synagogues and our temples, but it's in society. It's at the very heart of society. And I think there are three things that faith communities con contribute. Firstly, um, as we've heard, to the moral framework and the values. Secondly, in terms of networks, as we've also heard, faith communities can help their followers find jobs. And thirdly, in terms of infrastructure, faith communities provide uh, charities which give employment advice and charities which provide a safety net as well. So at Faith United, we'll certainly be taking this work forward over the next few weeks. In, indeed, it's going to be discussed tomorrow at our Faith United board meeting. So if you're interested in getting involved, please be in touch. And thank you again to our fantastic speakers and to everyone for attending today's webinar. Thank you all very much and look forward to seeing you soon. And let's keep up those ideas and translate some of that brilliant thinking and what you're doing individually within faith communities across in a collaborative way to have an even greater impact. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Becky. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.